to hear a conversation. First, you have some time to look at questions one to seven. Listen carefully to the first part of the conversation, and answer questions one to seven. Rita speaking. What should I do for you? Oh hi. I'd like to order some stationery. Could I know your name? Jackson Paris. Right. Can I just confirm your account number and the name of your company, Jackson? Sure. The number is six nine two four double one. Six nine two four double one, right? And you're from Rainbow Computer? No, the company is Rainbow Communications. Oh, okay. I'll just fix that on the system. Communications. And what would you like to order, Jackson? Envelopes. We need a box of A4. That is normal size envelopes. White, yellow, or Manila? We'll have the plain white, please. But the ones with the little windows. Okay, one box, A4, white. Just one box, was it? Um, on second thoughts, make those two boxes. We go through heaps of envelopes. As a matter of interest, are they made from recycled paper? No, you can't get white recycled paper. The recycled ones are grey, and they're more expensive, actually. Right, we'll stick to white then. Something else, Jackson? Yes, we need some coloured photocopy paper. What colours do you have? We've got purple, light blue, blue, light green, whatever you want, pretty much. There are five hundred sheets on the pack. Let me see. We're going to need a lot of blue paper for our new price lists. So can you give us ten packs, please? Make sure it's the light blue, though. Ten packs of the light blue. Anything else that we can help you with? Let me think. What else do we need? I'm sure there was something else. Ends, paper clips, fax paper, computer supplies, office furniture. Oh yes, we need floppy disks. Do you have those nice coloured ones? Yes, but they're a bit more expensive than the black ones. That's all right. I'm not paying anyway. Right, floppy disks. What about diaries next year? We've got them in stock already, and it's a good idea to order early. No, I think we're all right for diaries, but something we do need is one of those big wall calendars. You know, one that shows the whole year at a glance. Do you stock those? We certainly do. Okay, can you include a wall calendar then with the other stuff? Just make sure it's got the whole year on the one side. Sure. Now you have some time to look at questions eight to ten. Now listen to the next part of the conversation, and answer questions eight to ten. And do you have a copy of our new catalogue? No, I don't. But would you send one? Yes, I'll pop one in with the order. You'll find it a lot easier to remember what you need if you have our catalogue in front of you next time. Yes, good idea. And when can you deliver this? Should be with you tomorrow morning. Can you make sure that it's not after eleven thirty a.m. because we have to go out at twelve? There's only myself here on Fridays. Fine, I'll make a note in the delivery docket that they should deliver before half past eleven. Thanks very much. Thanks. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers.
Now turns to part two. Part two. You will hear an extract from a talk about the Scottish Highlands. First, you have 30 seconds to look at questions 11 to 18. Today I have with me Moira McKenzie, the author of several books in a well-known series of travel guides, and she'll be talking about what is probably the most fascinating wildlife area in Europe, the Scottish Highlands. Moira. Yes, that's right, and it's a wonderful place to visit with lots to do in an area that makes up over half of Scotland. Including the 790 islands that lie scattered around the coast, it covers 39,000 square kilometres. Getting there is easy. From here in Glasgow, a good starting point is Fort William on the west coast, with regular bus and rail services linking the two. I'd recommend the train, which takes four hours to get there. Alternatively, you can take the Highland Line, which takes the more easterly route up to Inverness. That, in fact, is a bit quicker, taking around three and a half hours to cover the 280 kilometres from here. There are also two main options by road. You can take either the A9 up through Stirling and Perth and then on to Inverness, or else on the west there's the A82, which runs up to Fort William and then, if you want, on to Inverness. Now, a lot of people associate the Highlands with bitterly cold weather, but in fact the region has a generally mild climate as a result of being surrounded on three sides by sea, particularly the warm waters of the Atlantic. At sea level in the west, for instance, the temperature ranges on average from a minimum of 1 degree centigrade in January up to 18 in July, and you can actually see palm trees growing there. Obviously, though, the temperatures will be lower inland and on higher ground. You can expect it to rain a lot too, particularly in the west, where annually as much as 2,000 millimetres regularly falls, though this helps account for the rich variety of vegetation and wildlife. When you get there, you'll find there are plenty of reasonably priced places to stay, in Fort William, for instance, you can find a room for the night in a small hotel or a bed and breakfast for just £25, or for £28 to £30 in Inverness. It's probably a good idea to book ahead, though, especially in the summer months. With all the leisure, sports and cultural activities on offer, the towns are becoming increasingly popular with visitors. For example, accommodation in Inverness won't be at all easy to find this year around the 23rd of July, as that's when the local Highland Games will take place. So, if your aim is to see the countryside, it may be best to stay in a small village. Now you have some time to look at questions 19 and 20. As I mentioned, there's a huge range of wildlife in the Highlands, but for those visiting the area, there are some basic ground rules that are essential if we are to protect it. Firstly, you should make every effort not to disturb birds and animals, and one way of doing this is to blend in with your surroundings, for instance by avoiding brightly coloured garments, such as orange anoraks. To see wildlife clearly, is best to use binoculars, keeping your distance. This is particularly important during the breeding season. Wherever possible, 
Use a hide so that they are less likely to detect your presence. Surprising though it may seem, visitors are advised to use their cars where no purpose-built hides are available, as people are apparently less likely to startle animals if they stay inside their vehicles. You may even find that creatures come up close to where you're parked, in which case, wait until they've gone before you move off. It should really go without saying that it's essential to be as quiet as possible, though sadly, some people need reminding of this. Oh, and one other thing. Wild animals and pets don't mix, so please leave your dog at home or at least somewhere he or she can't chase the wildlife or damage their habitat. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 26. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 26. Hello, my name is Emiliano. I am a student here and I'd like to rent a house for six months. OK, well you've come to the right place. We specialise in short-term rental. First of all, I would like to get a few details from you. Can you give me your full name, please? Yes, it is Emiliano Nespla. And can you tell me your present address, please? Yes, it's 17 Middle Way, Penrose. I'm living with a homestay family at the moment. That's great. Now, do you have any identification with you? Oh, and we will need a reference from someone who knows you here. Maybe your homestay family. Yes, OK. Here's my passport and a card from my language school. My reference can be Mrs. Alice Thompson. She's my homestay mother and she would mind, I'm sure. You can contact her at the same address as me, of course. OK. If we need to contact you, should we leave a message with your homestay? No, you can speak to me directly. My cell phone number is 021-548-3534. Great. Now, do you have a bank account? You will need to pay your rent by direct debit. You know, it will come out of your account automatically every month. OK. I don't have my bank account details with me now but I can get them and bring them back later today. That's fine. Now, can you tell me what kind of house you are looking for? Do you want to rent by yourself? No, I'm looking for a three-bedroom house. I want to rent with my two friends. I will bring them in to see you later today. OK. And what areas are you interested in renting in? Well, here's a map. Can you see my school? I don't have a car, so I need to take some kind of public transport to school and I don't want to travel for more than 30 minutes each way. Do you think you have anything which is suitable? Yes, we do. Here is a list of available properties. I'll highlight the ones that could be of interest to you. Look at the map and go and have a look at the houses with your friends. Do you have a friend with a car? Yes, I do. Good. So go and look outside the houses. It will give you an idea of what the area is like. But remember, don't go into the garden or knock on the door. If you want to go in and have a look, let me know and we can arrange an appointment. OK. Can you give me an idea of price? Yes. If you look at the list, you can see the weekly rent written next to the house address. Oh, yes. I can see it now. Do I need to pay anything else? 
Yes, you need to pay a deposit which you will get back when you move out and you have to pay a non-refundable agent fee which is equivalent to one week's rent. You will have to pay your bills when they come in every month too, of course. Okay, well, thank you very much for your help. What time should I come back with my friends and my bank details? How about 2.30 this afternoon? That sounds good. Thank you for your help. I'll see you later. Thanks for coming in. Goodbye. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 27 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 27 to 30. Hey, don't throw that can away. Why not? I've finished with it. Yes, but you can recycle things like that. Oh, I haven't got time to recycle everything I throw away. That's a terrible attitude. Don't you care about... Hello, you two. Hi, John. What are you arguing about? Oh, Sam says he doesn't have time to recycle. What do you think? Well, I agree that it can be difficult sometimes. Do you always recycle everything then, Mary? Yes, I think everyone should. I mean, look at the state of the planet. If we don't all start making an effort now, it could be too late. Well, one of the reasons I don't recycle as often as I should is that I don't really know where to go. There are no recycling facilities near me. Well, I know I said I haven't got time, but actually there is a bottle bank near the supermarket just up the road. So I suppose there are limited local facilities. So you can do your recycling outside the supermarket? Yes, but like I said, only limited. It's only a bottle bank. Well, I don't have a car, so it's very difficult for me, but I still do it. Sometimes a friend comes over and we take our recycling together, but not very often. So if your facilities are limited, then mine are very limited. Well, I suppose if you go to all that trouble, I might make more of an effort. Good. If it was up to me, I'd encourage more people to recycle. How? Well, how about some kind of incentive? A reward for anyone who makes an effort to recycle? That's a good idea. But if you think everyone should recycle, then why not penalise those who don't recycle instead of giving something to people that do? If there was a fine for anyone caught throwing recyclable materials in the rubbish, people would take more notice. Well, now you're going too far. Do you really want anyone going through your rubbish just to check if you're following the rules? No, I don't think fines are a good idea. Well, I think we should be doing something. Anyway, I have to go. I've got my social science class next. See you later. Yeah, see you later. Bye. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part four. Part four. You will hear a lecture about the Inuit Eskimos of Alaska and Canada. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now listen and answer questions 31 to 40. Good afternoon. In our lecture today, we will continue our study of people who inhabit the northernmost regions of the world. Our focus will be on the native inhabitants of Alaska and Canada, the Inuit Eskimos. 
They have been called the native inhabitants, as the Inuit were the people who had most recently migrated across the gap between Alaska and Siberia. Distinctly Asian in origin, the Inuit, which is literally translated the people in their native language, developed their civilization in what is now the Bering Sea region about 1,000 years ago. Their culture spread eastward and is called the Thule culture, after the place in northern Greenland where archaeologists first discovered it. The first Europeans to meet Inuit people were Norse settlers in what is now northern Newfoundland, Canada. These settlers lived there for a short time around 1000 AD. Approximately 500 years later, beginning in the 1500s, European whalers, fishing crews, and explorers met many Inuit along the coast of Labrador. Russians and other Europeans first met Alaskan Inuit in the 1700s. One hundred years later, in the mid-1800s, whalers began to hunt in the Arctic. Some Inuit were employed by whalers and traded with them during that time. Perhaps one of the most interesting aspects of the Inuit is how they were able to survive and grow in such a harsh Arctic environment. Firstly, and not surprisingly, their homes were well adapted to the freezing conditions. They lived in predominantly two types of housing that would keep them warm. In the cold summer they would live in tents that were made from the skin of the animals they had hunted for food, and they also traveled in boats. These were called umiaks by the natives. In the winter they would live in houses made of sod, and when on hunting trips, they would commute by dog sled and build temporary houses made from ice. These igloos, which is the Inuit word for house, were uniquely made with a sharp blade carved out of walrus tusk. They would cut large blocks of hard packed snow, about three meters wide, out of the ground. The blocks would then be used to build a six meter dome over a wide, shallow hole. Within one or two hours, an igloo up to ten meters in length could be built. It was weatherproof and large enough to house an entire family. Very early in their history, they managed to develop the technology to hunt the huge bowhead whale, which was the staple food source for them at that time. They also hunted walruses and seals. On land, they hunted polar bears, moose, and various other game. The harsh environment in which they lived meant that a steady supply of food was often difficult to come by. Therefore, the Inuit were a people constantly on the move, looking for food, which meant that their dwellings had to be easily built and easily dismantled. They inhabited the wide open land and, as such, moved freely around it in search of food. Today the traditional way of life has basically ended for the Inuit. They live in wooden homes rather than in snow houses, sod houses, or tents. They wear modern clothing instead of animal skin garments. Most Inuit speak English and Russian. Some speak Danish, while fewer still continue to hold on to their cultural roots by passing on to the younger generation their native language. The kayak and umiak, their principal means of travel, have given way to the motorboat, and the snowmobile has replaced the dog team. The combined percentage of the Inuit population in Alaska and Canada stands at 63%, the latter being 29% and the former around 34%. Some Alaskan Inuit live in towns and cities, but the majority live in small settlements and hunt and fish for most of their food. Most of those in Canada live in towns and housing provided by... That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.